to welcome everyone to the first 2014 CLAUF Distinguished Lecture in Jurisprudence. The CLAUF Center, directed by, by, by my colleague Vlad Peju, is one of the most distinguished centers for the study of constitutional democracy in the world. It is a highly inter interdisciplinary institution bringing together jurists, economists, political scientists, historians, theologians, philosophers, novelists, sociologists, and many others. The center is a hub for thinking imaginatively about the challenges of political and social organization in the 21st century. A joint initiative of the Boston College Law School and the Klauff Center, the Klauff's Distinguished Lectures in Jurisprudence is already a leading forum in the world for the presentation and debate of grand, plural, and imaginative work in legal thought that confronts the challenges of our time. As we contemplate the future, the present and the possible futures ahead of us, we recognize the extraordinary opportunities open to the cognitive, normative, and creative powers of the mind. Legal thought can and should provide a vantage point from which to understand and to engage the challenges and opportunities of the age. This is precisely the kind of legal thought the Cloud Jurisprudence Lectures seeks to host and to promote. Past lectures have included thinkers such as Amartya Sen, Nicola Lacey, Jeremy Waldron, Shona Schifrin, and Jürgen Habermas. Today, it is our privilege to welcome Roberto Magadera Unger to the Harvard Law School, sorry, from, uh, the Harvard Law School Roscoe Paulin Professor of Law as the Cloud Distinguished Lecturer in Jurisprudence. To do justice to Roberto Unger's significance to the history of ideas is no small task. I have a list in mind, which I believe captures the essence of what I would say about his work if we had many more hours to stay here. The list goes like this. Plato, Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas, Thomas Hobbes, Spinoza, William Blackstone, Rousseau, Kant, Hegel, John Stuart Mill, Max Weber, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Martin Heidegger, Wittgenstein, A.J. Leigh Hart, Hannah Arendt, Michel Foucault, John Rawls, Roberto Unger. Ladies and gentlemen, Roberto Unger. <laughs> talented person, wrote Schopenhauer, is a marksman who can hit a target that others cannot hit. A genius is a marksman who can hit a target that others cannot see. Uh, the genius does not think more cleverly. He sees more. Genius becomes prophecy when the object of vision is a higher form of life, a form by virtue of which we can increase our share in the attributes that rightly or wrongly we attribute to God, especially the attribute of transcendence over circumstance. But vision is not enough to distinguish prophecy. Prophecy requires the marriage of visionary insight to exemplary action. The characteristic method of the prophet is to foreshadow in the here and now, the larger future, the greater life that he sees. We all doubt. We all lose faith unless we can touch the wound. Uh, 
the method of prophecy demonstrates the greater future in some tangible anticipation. Who then is the prophet? Who is the agent of prophecy understood in this form? The prophet under democracy is not simply an individual who claims special proximity to the sacred, to the higher form of life. The prophet is potentially everyone. The central creed of democracy is faith in the constructive genius and in the prophetic powers of ordinary men and women. It is from the standpoint of these ideas that I make my intervention today. My central claim is that legal thought has a prophetic task and that this prophetic task is its higher calling. The prophetic task of legal thought is to marshal the variations, the contradictions of our existing arrangements manifest in the law toward the creation of a higher form of life. If that is the greater task of legal thought, legal thought also has a lesser task, a smaller but nevertheless indispensable vocation that has often in the history of legal thought usurp the place of the higher calling. The lesser vocation of legal thought is to deal with the application of law and its interpretation within and outside the adjudicative setting. And in the history of modern legal ideas, the defining question has long been, what should follow the doctrinal formalism of the 19th century? When we can no longer think of law as a gapless system of rules that can generate the single right solution by a quasi-deductive method of inference, how should we think of it? And the most promising point of departure for an answer to this question was the one suggested toward the end of the 19th century and at the beginning of the 20th by jurists like Holmes, Yering, and Genie. They proposed that in the exercise of this lesser vocation, Law should be approached always purposively by the attribution of purpose. But without the pretense of organizing the purposes that set the meaning of law in idealized systems. But this point of departure was rejected in the main line of the history of 20th century legal thought. And thus there arose what can only be regarded as a calamity. The calamity was the triumph of a practice of legal analysis that one might call using its own congratulatory self-description, the method of reasoned elaboration. Law was viewed as a fallible but cumulative approximation to an intelligible and defensible plan of social life that could be expounded retrospectively by the jurists in the vocabulary of impersonal policy and principle. Retrospective rationalization what one might call in the vocabulary of the history of philosophy, right-wing Hegelianism, was the animating spirit of this practice. 
it turned its back on the higher vocation of legal thought, the prophetic task that I earlier described, and it distorted the understanding of the lesser task. And it has imposed now three great costs on legal culture in all the societies in which it has exercised its immense influence. The first cost is the cost of mystification, a radical understatement of the degree of variety and contradiction in the law for the sake of pretending that there is more of a system than there really is the system that can be described retrospectively in the language of policy and principle. The second cost has been the cost of usurpation, the usurpation of democratic power by the jurists, who under the disguise of interpreting the law and pretending to find the elements of this system in the legal materials in fact, make it up. But the third and by far the largest cost has been the cost of stagnation, the failure to pursue the dialectic between institutions and practices and ideals and interests, which is the very lifeblood of the law. The creation of the greater future from the fragmentary and contradictory elements that we have in the extant law. This practice of reasoned elaboration, headquartered most strongly in the legal cultures of the United States and of Germany, has now been exported to the whole world and represented as the providential successor to the 19th century formalism. How could this calamity have arisen? It has several roots. The first root is the vanity of the jurists and their lust for power. This method of legal analysis gives them an important work to do and pretends that this important work can be reconciled with the claims of democracy. The second route has been a series of particular political projects, in fact, just variants of the same project. Its characteristic American form in the late 20th century was the attempt of the progressive jurists to circumvent American politics as the people failed to give them through the elected institutions the program that they wanted. They sought to obtain that program from the courts, especially the federal courts until this attempt at circumventing political politics by judicial politics collapsed and the empire struck back. The third root of the calamity has been the absence of any major renovation of the dominant institutional and ideological settlement in the North Atlantic societies since the mid 20th century. The settlement that in Europe goes under the name of social democracy and in the United States as the New Deal. And the fourth route has been the deficit of structural imagination, of insight into structure and structural change and structural alternatives in all the dominant tendencies of social science, political philosophy, and the humanities. And thus we have an explanation of how it is that legal thought has taken this 
misdirection. Here I am mainly concerned with the consequences of this misdirection insofar as they suppress what I earlier called the higher calling of legal thought, its prophetic task. I now develop my argument by four steps. In the first step, I make claims about the nature of law and of legal doctrine. In the second step, I place these ideas in the context of an elementary view of the universal history of legal thought. In the third step of my argument, I ask in what way and to what extent contemporary law generates some of the tools that we would require to fulfill the prophetic vocation of legal thought. And in the fourth step of my argument, I ask what it means today to think and to act as a jurist and as a human being in a prophetic spirit. The nature of law and of legal doctrine. Our interests and ideals are always nailed to the cross of the institutions and practices that represent them in fact. The site of this crucifixion is the law. Uh, and thus law always has these two aspects. The aspect of institutions and practices and the aspect of the conceptions of social life, the understandings of ideals and of interests by which we make sense of the institutions and practices and elaborate them in context. The characteristic concern of the jurist has been the development of legal doctrine. Now first let me say what I mean by a jurist. And then let me develop the notion of legal doctrine. By a jurist, I mean simply a lawyer, someone who engages law with an interest in the future, in the future of law and of society. And thus you will see that I have incorporated already into my definition of the jurist some bias in the prophetic direction. The characteristic work of the jurist throughout the history of law in all legal traditions has been the development of legal doctrine. But what is legal doctrine? This is the ancient and universal practice of the jurist. So mysterious, so elusive, so contradictory to the assumptions of our present ideas, our epistemological ideas and our political ideas, that we have trouble understanding what doctrine is. So the jurists see the social order as not simply a savage and random set of compromise but as the flawed version of a vision of human life, a model of human association. And they develop this vision in categorical details in the form of doctrine. It is the spiritualized representation of the institutional form of the life of a people, which is the law. To understand the nature of doctrine, it is useful to compare it 
to two other doctrinal practices that equally appear uh, archaic and suspect in the light of our present ideas. Normative grammar, by contrast to scientific linguistics, and theology, by contrast to the sociology or anthropology of religion. The doctrinal practices in law and in these other areas are distinguished by four connected attributes. The first attribute is that doctrine is constitutive of its subject matter. It is not a discourse from above or from a distance. It is not simply a discourse about a phenomenon as one might have a scientific view of the structure of a natural phenomenon. It enters into the constitution of its subject matter. The second attribute of doctrine is that if the discourse and the subject matter are inseparable, the subject matter itself is divided in two, or as it were, two-dimensional. It has a level of surface, of symbolic expression, and then it has a depth of experience, of existence, of vision, which is translated into these symbols. A third characteristic of the doctrinal discipline is that the practitioner of doctrine is not a disinterested student, but rather someone who has a stake in the constitution or the development of the material, in this case, the material of the law, in one direction or another. And the fourth characteristic of doctrine is that the evolution of the material has practical consequence for the exercise of power or authority, whether it is the power of the state or some other form of power. That has been the main occupation of the jurists, not for hundreds, but for thousands of years in all the major legal traditions. And doctrine has always been pursued under the shadow of the power of the state and the creation of law by the state. So that an enigma arises in the history of law and legal thought about the relation of law as doctrine to law as the will of the state. And I shall address this enigma in the next part of my argument. So here is a first view of what law is and of legal doctrine as the, the characteristic work of the jurist. But our understanding of both law and legal doctrine is then narrow. by a series of adventitious interests which threaten to, to cloud our vision. So there is the legal profession, the profession of attorneys and judges. And then there is the concern with adjudication, the resolution of disputes in adjudicative and quasi-adjudicative settings. But from the standpoint of this understanding of law, all of that can only be a fragment. Although it is from the standpoint of that fragment that many of the jurists want to approach the law and legal doctrine. So where then should doctrine, 
and the understanding of law in this broad sense be pursued. It seems hard to pursue it in the context of law schools that are devoted to the formation of the legal professional and obsessed with the question, how should judges decide cases? But it seems equally hard to imagine how this task could be pursued in the social science departments, in other parts of the university system or of the culture. Given the hostility of the dominant tendencies of thought to the premises of doctrine. Law and doctrine understood in this way have no home. But of course, the spirit never has a home. And nothing important, no deep insight, has ever a ready-made setting. So what we must do is to to break into one of these settings and convert it to the use for which it was not designed. What will we do with doctrine? How will we reinvent it? There is a valid element in the ancient idea of doctrine. It is the conception that law is not just something made by the state, but rather society makes itself through the law. And the state and what the state does is simply part of this broader picture. But there is also something illusory in the ancient idea of doctrine. What is illusory in the ancient idea of doctrine is the premise that there is a natural order waiting to be discovered. And then, in the vocabulary of this method of reasoned elaboration, expounded in the language of impersonal policy and principle. There is no single necessary or natural order of social life. Social life is made and imagined. We make it. And as Vico remarked, because we make these structures, we can understand them as the creator understands his creation. Nevertheless, the notion that there is a natural order survives in a myriad of forms in contemporary legal and political thought. I give you only one example among many. The state action doctrine in American public law, which presupposes that there is a distinction between social states of affairs in the creation of which the government is complicit and other states of affairs that are somehow just there, pre-politically. But there are no states of affairs in society that are just there. All of them have been made. And all of them have been, in some way, politically constituted. So if doctrine is to be salvaged, it has to be turned into something that it is not yet. Now I advance to the second part of my argument. I place these ideas about law and doctrine in the context of a broad rudimentary view of the universal history of legal thought. I make a bold claim. I claim that in the history of law and legal thought in all major traditions, including both the common law and the civil law traditions, but many others as well, we can distinguish three persistent elements. And the relation among these three elements is the key. 
to an understanding of the problems and of the promise of the universal history of legal thought. The first element is law as doctrine, just as I described it before. An imminent normative order in social life that the jurists will then expound in their categories. The second element in the universal history of legal thought is the idea of law as the will of the state. Whoever has and maintains supreme power makes the law. And under democracy, this sovereignty in the making of the law gains added legitimacy. But there is a third element in the history of legal thought, without which the other two elements and their relations to each other cannot be understood. The third element is the actual structure of society. Unjustified, unexplained, and to some extent even unseen. Now I make some remarks about each of these three elements. First, law as doctrine. I have already defined what doctrine is. So I want simply to point out the two major problems which this element in the universal history of legal thought generates. The first problem is the problem of its contradiction with the other view of law, the view of law as the will of the state. And the view of law as the will of the state cannot be disregarded, especially under democracy, because under democracy, the law is supposed to be made by the democratic institutions. So from the very beginning, doctrine, which is not simply customary law in stateless societies, has coexisted with this other idea of law as the will of the state. But there is a manifest contradiction between these two ideas of law. The overriding concern of legal theory, of jurisprudence, for generations has been the management of this contradiction. Now let me describe the contradiction in its most recent and familiar form. The form in which it arises in what I call the method of reasoned elaboration. The jurist wants to represent the law as a repository of impersonal policies and principles that generate the purposes which in turn guide the interpretation of law. And if it's not quite a coherent and perfected system, it's supposed to be a continuous approximation to a system or to a series of systems. A model or a set of models of human association for different parts of social life, <coughs> represented in the language of policy and principle. Now, the jurist cannot credibly pretend that this system is already completely there in the law, waiting simply to be uncovered and described. Because how can the law, as the product of a conflict of visions and of interests, possibly come to look after the fact as if it were an approximation to a system? The agents who struggled over the content of law in politics, in national life, would have to be deluded. And if they were deluded to that extent, democracy could not maintain its pretension. 
So the jurist must pretend that the system is only partly there, not completely there. But if, on the other hand, it is not at least partly there, then he, the jurist, would be put in the position of making it all up, but pretending that it was there. And that would be an overt usurpation of democratic power and untenable. And thus, all the major legal theories are concerned to show by what magic it is possible to walk this fine line between too much of the system being there and too little of it being there. And how do they differ among themselves? They differ simply in their proposal of the vocabulary in which this magic trick is to be performed. Whether it is some theory of rights and principles or of law and economics or of legal process, a divergence which is entirely secondary to their main and overriding convergence. Now there is a second problem uh, generated by the element of doctrine in the universal history of legal thought. And the second problem is the incompleteness of doctrine. Doctrine presupposes something that it does not reveal, explain, or justify, which is the actual structure of society and culture. Suppose that at a distant time and place, the materials of Roman jurisprudence, of classical Roman law, were to fall into your hands. The Roman law of sale or of marriage or any of the many uh, aspects of, the, of the, the juridical culture of the Romans, which they regarded as their supreme achievement, you wouldn't be able to make sense of it unless you knew independently something about their society and culture. And it is only by that independent knowledge of the social and cultural context that the doctrine would acquire meaning. But this reference to the real structure is left invisible in the culture of doctrine, presupposed but unannounced. Now there is a second element in the universal history of legal thought, and this is the element that I called law as the will of the state. Law is not, according to this second idea, the imminent normative order explicated by the jurists in the categories of doctrine. Law is whatever the state wants it to be. Law is whatever those who hold highest political power decide. One version of this view of law is the version that we have in analytical jurisprudence, as in Hart and Kelsen. But it is by far the less interesting version. The other much more interesting version is what you might call the fighting theory of law. It has been developed for centuries by jurists like Yering and Holmes and by political thinkers like Thomas Hobbes and Carl Schmitt. On this view, Law is the product of a struggle, of a struggle among interests and among visions. And what the law is at a given moment is simply a photograph of a moment in that struggle. 
a series of shifting truth lines among these classing visions and these conflicting interests. And that then is the law. And this view, which may seem an entirely disenchanted view of the law, in fact acquires higher moral and political legitimacy under the claims of democracy. What is democracy if it is not the mastery of structure through conflict over the terms of social life? So once again, this second element in the universal history of legal thought generates two problems, exactly symmetrical to the problems raised by the first element, the element of doctrine. The first problem is the same contradiction. There are these two ideas about law. Both of them are canonical. Both are indispensable, but they completely contradict each other. Law is doctrine and law is will of the state. And the second problem is once again the radical incompleteness of the idea of law as the will of the state and its unacknowledged dependence on the real, unexplained, unjustified, and even unseen structure of society. In medieval legal thought and uh, medieval law in Europe, there was the distinction between two forms of lawmaking, the jurisdictio and the gubernaculum. The jurisdictio was the statement of the common law, common law also in the civil law sense. The universal law, the law of doctrine, the ancient law, and the gubernaculum is the episodic intervention by the prince, adapting the law to change circumstance or pressing exigency. Now consider the law of the 19th and 20th centuries. It's supposed to be completely different from that medieval picture, but it turns out not to be. A common lawyer thinks that the civil law has become, at least since the 19th century, a code-based law. And the codifications are the most characteristic expression of the will of the state, or so it is thought. But every civil lawyer knows that the opposite is true. The great private law codes are formulated by the jurists as restatements or summations of doctrine. And statutory law, as it really happens in these contemporary societies, is not the making of the whole structure of society. It's simply a series of episodic interventions in an inherited structure which for the most part is left untouched. And is that not just like the picture of the jurisdictio and the gubernaculum? And thus it turns out that these first two elements in the universal history of legal thought refer to and depend on the third element. The third element is the real structure of society, the uninvited guess on which everything depends. And here arises a great problem for our contemporary understanding of law and society. 
and the great problem is connected to a great opportunity. The great problem is theoretical. The great opportunity is practical. The great problem is that we now have, across the whole field of social studies and humanities, no usable understanding of structure or of structural change or of structural alternatives. I simply state dogmatically without developing the following four theses. The first thesis is that the central revolutionary insight of classical European social theory, beginning in Montesquieu and in Vico and going through the great social theorists of the 19th century, including Karl Marx, was that the structures of society are made and imagined. We made them. Although they appear to us as if they were an alien fate. They are a kind of frozen politic. And they exist only to the extent that ongoing conflict over the terms of social life is contained or interrupted. And then they acquire a mendacious semblance of naturalness, necessity, and authority. The second thesis is that this revolutionary insight, the greatest achievement of classical social theory, was circumscribed and corrupted by a series of deterministic concessions. The idea that there's a closed list of institutional orders, Marx's modes of production, that each of them is an indivisible system, and that their succession in history is governed by a set of laws, all false. The third thesis is that contemporary positive social science has to a very large extent abandoned and suppressed the central structural insight of classical social theory, even as it has also repudiated these illusions of false necessity that corrupted that insight in classical social theory. And the consequence, the overriding consequence, is that in our understanding of society, the vital link between insight into the actual and imagination of the possible, of the adjacent possible, of the next steps, which is the possible that matters, has been severed. with the result that we have no understanding at all of structure or structural change, because to understand the state of affairs is just to understand what it can become. And because we lack this structural insight, we then think that a proposal is realistic to the extent that it approaches what already exists and is utopian to the extent that it differs from what exists. Proximity to the existent becomes the bastardized surrogate criterion of political realism when we have no understanding of structural change. The fourth thesis is that the task, therefore, is to rescue and radicalize the central insight of classical social theory, liberating it from the deterministic concessions that corrupted it. So on this view that I am summarizing through these dogmatic theses, the reorientation of legal theory and the reconstruction of social thought of our understanding of society are inseparable. Uh, Law is where we deal with the structure of society in detail. 
in the detail of the institutional arrangements, not simply in abstractions like the market economy or capitalism. And therefore, if we are to have a usable view of structure, that view passes through a reorientation of legal thought. There is a valid element, I said, in the idea of doctrine, which is that society makes itself through law. Law is not just a fabrication by the state, but there is also an illusion. And the illusion is that there is an order that is somehow just there, not constituted by politics. And similarly, there is a valid element in the idea of law as the will of the state, which is just the mirror image of the illusion in the idea of doctrine, namely that the structure of society is a creation, that we make it. But there is an illusion, and the illusion is to suppose that the existing forms of the market economy and of democratic politics, in fact, master the structure. They do not. And because they do not, the law made by the state is simply a series of episodic interventions in a structure that is left largely untouched. This view of the universal history of legal thought therefore leads to a practical conclusion. The problem is not to find somehow a reconciliation of these contradictory views of law. The problem is to understand the great underlying theme presaged in the universal history of legal thought. The underlying theme is the self-construction of society through law. How is that idea of the self-construction of society through law to be made real? Only by a series of institutional changes, of changes in the actual organization of society, and then these contradictions will disappear in practice rather than just in theory. In the spirit of Marx's theses on Feuerbach, in which the enigmas of theory are resolved in the achievements of practice. What would give tangible meaning to the idea of the self-construction of society? Large institutional projects, which although radical in their reach, may be fragmentary and gradual in their method. One such project is to democratize the market economy, to democratize it, not just to regulate it, not just to compensate for the inequalities that it generates through retrospective and compensatory tax and transfer. The market economy, for example, should not be pinned to a single version of itself. It has no natural form. Alternative regimes of private and social property might coexist experimentally within the same economy. And to what end? To the end of giving more people more access to more markets in more ways, and especially more access to the advanced sectors of the economy, the sectors that are closest to the imagination. And the second great project is the project of deepening democracy, of creating a high-energy democracy. And what is a high-energy democracy? It is a democracy that passes a triple test, that it, in fact, masters the structure rather than leaving it unchallenged and unchanged, that it overthrows the rule of the living by the dead, and that it weakens the dependence 
of change on crisis. All the existing flawed low energy democracies fail to master the structure, perpetuate the government of the living by the dead, and continue to make transformation depend on trauma in the form of economic ruin and war. And there would have to be a series of institutional innovations, some of them raising the temperature of politics to a higher level of organized popular engagement in political life. Others accelerating the tempo of politics through the rapid resolution of impasse. And others yet enhancing the possibility of creating, in particular sectors of the society or parts of the country, counter models of the national future. Now all of this may seem very speculative and remote, but I give you an American example. There are two principles governing the American constitutional ideas. There is a liberal principle of the fragmentation of power, and there is a conservative principle of the slowing down of politics, enshrined in Madison's scheme of separation of powers. The Americans think that these two principles are naturally and necessarily combined, but they are mistaken. These two principles are combined by design and intention rather than by necessity. And it is perfectly possible to have a constitutional scheme that radicalizes the liberal principle of the fragmentation of power, but repudiates the conservative principle of the slowing down of politics. Now I come to the third step of my argument. And the third step of my argument then asks, to what extent and in what way does contemporary law provide us with tools for the prosecution of these large projects, such as democratizing the market economy or deepening democracy, that would give practical substance to the idea of the self-construction of society? And once again, I can only sketch my answer to this question. And I sketch it by distinguishing the characteristic genius of law in different historical moments. By the genius, I mean the spirit, the dominant spirit, manifest in the details of institutions and practices expressed in the law. The genius of 19th century law is summarized in the, the typological idea, the idea that there is a type. And among types, a type of free society and that this type has a built-in legal content. That was the real significance of the 19th century doctrinal formalism, not the superstitious and mechanical conceptualism that the 20th century jurists attributed to it. The free society is a structure. The structure has an inbuilt legal content manifest in the system of doctrine. The genius of 20th century law lay in the dialectical reorganization of all of law in response to the following problem. It is not enough formally to describe and establish rights of individual and collective self-determination. If the individual lacks the practical means effectively to enjoy these rights. Otherwise, the law will be a sham. And thus, all law in the 20th century was reorganized as an interplay 
between rules and doctrines defining individual or collective self-determination and rules and doctrines guaranteeing the practical conditions for the exercise of those formal rights. For example, within contract law, the relation between the traditional rules of offer and acceptance and the doctrines of economic duress or unconscionability. Between contract law and labor law, the reestablishment of the reality of contract in the circumstances of radically unequal bargaining power in the employment situation. And more generally, in the relation between all of private law and all of public law. That was the accomplishment of 20th century law and legal thought, to think of law in that way. And its characteristic failure was not to have pursued this idea of guaranteeing the conditions of the effective enjoyment of rights in an exploration of alternative institutional directions for society. And thus we come to what I take to be the genius of law in the 21st century. I interpret this characteristic spirit as an answer to a problem. The problem is the following. We today, in the 21st century, have come to understand that everything in society depends on the structure, on the institutional organization of society. And in this respect, we are just like the 19th century liberals and socialists. We understand the need for structural solutions. Unlike them, however, we can no longer confidently believe in definitive structural blueprints in some one institutional scheme that once and for all will solve the problems and fulfill our interests and ideals. And therefore, we ask ourselves how we can have structural insight without succumbing to structural dogmatism. The most original and distinctive ideas of law and legal thought in the 21st century have to do with this problem. Now, all I can do in, the, in a few moments is to describe this concern at the highest level of abstraction, not in the form of particular ideas about contract or property, but in the form of what you might call meta-legal ideas ideas that cut across many fields and have a myriad of applications. And I distinguish, in particular, two such meta-ideas that are characteristic of the legal and political thought of the 21st century in this spirit that I've just described. Let me call the first idea the idea of the structure revising structure. So we don't know what the definitive structural solution is. Hence, we need a structure that is capable of correcting itself or being corrected in the light of experience. And then we'll discover the path along the way. One interpretation of that idea is the notion of the democratized market economy, not pinned to a single version of itself, accommodating a range of different regimes of contract and property, and facilitating a radicalization of the experimentalist impulse. And the second interpretation, 
is the idea of a high energy democracy that no longer requires crisis to make change possible. Now here is a second such meta idea responsive to the same spirit. Let me call it the idea of plasticity enabling endowments. Society should be made plastic. It should be thrown open to experiment to the greatest possible extent. We can advance only by experimenting, not by entrenching some dogmatic solution. But for this wider field of experiment to be tolerable and effective, the individual citizen and worker must be and feel secure in a haven of vitally protected interests, immunities, and capabilities. He must be like the Seraph Abdiel described in Paradise Lost unshaken, unsubdued, unterrified. We must guarantee him the better to throw everything else open to experiment. Here's a homely example of what that means, of one of the many practical manifestations. It means the generalization of a principle of social inheritance that everyone would be guaranteed a minimal patrimony, a basic stock of assets on which he could draw at turning points in his life. 40 acres and a mule translated into the terms of the 21st century. The general conception from which this particular idea arises is a conception that we can understand, for example, by reference to the relation of the love of a parent to the adventures of a child. The parent says to the child, I love you unconditionally, independently of whatever you do. Now you have my unconditional love. Go out and raise a storm in the world. And this, once we tear away the veneer of metaphysical and theological pretense, is the pragmatic residue of the idea of fundamental rights. Translated now into this conception of plasticity enabling endowments. The law contains the materials in the form of the contradictions and the variations for these campaigns. And in this way, the jurist begins to execute his prophetic task. I reach now the fourth and last state of my last stage of my argument and ask, returning to the beginning of my remarks, what it means to act as a jurist and as a human being in a prophetic spirit. Underlying my entire argument about law and legal thought is a conception of humanity and of the self. We are shaped by circumstance, by context, by the social and conceptual worlds that we build and inhabit. Nevertheless, there is always more in us, in each of us individually and in all of us collectively, the human race, than there is or ever can be in them. They are finite in relation to us, and we are infinite in relation to them. We exceed them immeasurably. And this is our attribute of transcendence that defines our humanity. 
it is this feature that we would seek to extend, enlarging our share in the attributes that we ascribe to the divine. Through the transformation of society and the reorientation of life. Let me illustrate then this spirit of prophetic action in two ways. First, I illustrate it with respect to our attitude to roles. The roles that are made available in a society are always designed for the reproduction of that society. But if we have views such as these that I have defended here, we can never accept these roles on their own terms. We must always stretch and bend the role and turn it into something else. We must always be divided or ambivalent about the conventions and expectations of the role. We cannot surrender unconditionally to the role we must resist. And one such role is the role of the jurist, which according to these ideas, we must reinvent. Uh, now consider a second application of this conception of the prophetic spirit. Our relation to the nations and states into which humanity remains divided. I begin with a remark about a core premise of classical liberal theory. The premise is that we can and should distinguish between an impersonal order of right which it is the concern of the liberal state to uphold, and which is neutral with respect to contentious or sectarian visions of the good, and these visions of the good. Now, the problem is that no institutional form of social life, that is to say no law, can be neutral among conceptions of the good or of humanity. It is impossible. And when this impossible objective is pursued, it is invariably found to be in the service of the entrenchment of a sectarian view, falsely represented as impersonal or neutral. Nevertheless, the illusory goal of neutrality has an affinity to a realistic goal with which it should not be mistaken. And that is that the institutional order should be as much as possible open, open to challenge, open to contradiction, open to experiment. And above all, it should be corrigible. It should be organized to facilitate its own transformation. The realistic goal of corrigibility takes the place of the illusory and dangerous aim of neutrality. The nations of the world are ceasing to be tribes based on ethnic and cultural homogeneity. The role of the difference among nations and among states in a world of democracies is to represent a form of moral specialization within humanity. Humanity can develop its powers and possibilities only by developing them in different directions, in different forms of life. And humanity is united only by becoming different. And thus, these different states and nations must each of them be experiments in the form of humanity. Experiments that, as I argued before, can never be neutral among conflicting conceptions of humanity. But this view has, in order to achieve its objective, to satisfy at least two great conditions. 
The first condition is that the individual who finds himself in one of these experiments in humanity be able to rebel against it and, if necessary, to leave it, to escape from one form of humanity to another. And our greatest interest in the organization of the world order is to increase the freedom to cross national frontiers and to recombine the elements of humanity to the advantage of these experiments. But the second great premise of the legitimacy and efficacy of this moral specialization within humanity is that each of the experiments be rich in diversity and open to contradiction and resistant to the marriage of a conception with a particular contingent set of institutions with an institutional formula. And that's the role of the jurist, of the prophetic jurist, of the jurist who reorients legal doctrine in the spirit that I have defended. Now, this task has a special meaning in the United States. Americans have long been tempted to succumb to a superstition about themselves and about society. The superstition is that the United States discovered at the time of its foundation the definitive formula of a free society, which has only to be adjusted from time to time under the pressure of crisis. According to this superstition, the rest of humanity must either subscribe to this formula or continue to languish in poverty and despotism. This superstition has been immensely prejudicial to the American people. By denying them the institutional experiments vital to the progress of American democracy, a long line of American thinkers, from Thomas Jefferson to John Dewey, attempted to persuade their fellow citizens to lift the exemption of the institutional arrangements of the country from the experimentalist impulse that is otherwise so vital in American culture. But these thinkers, on the whole, failed. And thus, the problem remains. This superstition has a nature and a name. It is a species of idolatry. The first work of the prophet is to smash the idols. We are commanded to be in the world without being of it. To obey this command, each of us must, according to his circumstance, act in a prophetic spirit, even the jurists. Jurists can become prophets without ceasing to be jurists. Well, we should have a distance from the inherited understandings of prophecy. So I, I myself began this intervention with an argument about the reinvention of the role of the prophet. 
So it's, I, I take it not to be a, in contradiction to, to my claim about roles, but rather to be an example of this, of this claim about roles. The role of the prophet is not exempt from the same principle. Uh, it, it, it doesn't exist in an essential form. It has a history. So uh, the characteristic uh, aspect of the role of the prophet is this idea that there's a single inspired individual who stands above the rest. Uh, in the Protestant Reformation, there was the idea of the, the priesthood of all believers. And I claimed uh, that uh, these views require uh, an idea of the prophetic power of, of, of everyone, uh, disseminated throughout society, but sustained by a transformation of the arrangements, of the economy, of politics, and of education. Please. Please. Thank you very much for, for the talk. Uh, I do have a particular question for you, Professor, uh, regarding uh, your view on the future of international law. Because uh, I think that, as you mentioned in the lecture, that states at the international level, they struggle for survival. So I take it to be an aspect of the problem of the organization of pluralism in the world. Um, so one way in which this question can be approached is in the form of an argument about the current direction of globalization. And just as I say that the market economy is not there on a take it or leave it basis, so I say that globalization is not there on a take it or leave it basis. Uh, with respect to the market, I say the dominant model of ideological controversy is the market versus the state. More market, less state. Less market, more state, synthesis of market and states, hydraulic model of ideological controversy, which I oppose because I believe that both the market economy and democratic politics can and should be reshaped in their institutional form. So too with globalization. It's not more globalization and less globalization, but which globalization? So let me give the example of the uh, world trade regime under the WTO treaties. It's organized on the principle that free trade is the goal, it should be maximized. But free trade is not the goal. The goal is the coexistence of alternative experiences of development and of, and of civilization within a world economy that gradually becomes more open. The second principle is that the trading states are required as a condition 
of their accession to the treaties, to adhere not simply to the market economy in the abstract, but to a particular version of the market economy, destructive of the institutional experiments that they require. For example, all of the forms of strategic coordination between governments and firms that the countries now rich use to become rich risk being outlawed under the label subsidies. And what we should have instead is a kind of institutional minimalism, the greatest degree of economic openness with the least restraint on institutional experiments, including the experiments in the change of the market economy. Then the third principle for the organization of the present global order in trade is the radical contrast between the treatment of capital and things and the treatment of people. So money and things gain freedom to cross national frontiers, but people are imprisoned in the nation state or in blocks of homogeneous nation states, relatively homogeneous nation states, such as the European Union. And this too should be resisted in favor of the idea that people must gain freedom together with things and with money in small cumulative steps. The, the movement of things and of money is sometimes useful and sometimes prejudicial. But the movement of people is sacrosanct because it is part of the process by which humanity develops itself and is unified through divergence. So we would have to have a, a, a criticism of globalization, and that would be one of the points of departure. A problem remains, however, at the end of the day. And the problem is that this pluralism that we must advocate must not be an unqualified pluralism, as I already suggested in my remarks about the nation state. So, we don't want just a pluralism of anything. We want a pluralism in which none of the forms of social life that are established in these different versions of humanity become prisons, recalcitrant to challenge and change, and intolerant of escape and resistance. So. All of this proceeds from a certain vision of humanity, and this vision is far from being neutral. This vision is a contentious vision in a struggle among visions in the world. Yes? Yes. Um, the contentious difference between structure and force, um, between social forces and social structures, why is it, if it is significant to your argument, that you present the argument in terms of social structures rather than social forces? I could see the argument being as, as various forces in society struggling with each other, against each other, in trying to to amass themselves into structures, unable to do so, and so that's that kind of argument. The second one is somewhat related, and it has to do with the idea of roles. Um, we, we do not inhibit roles, we are, we are larger than them, yet, and my question is one of sequence. We are also born into roles. We're born into the role of a child to have. We're born into certain roles. At, at what point, and you could say a little bit more about the sequence, at what point does the greatest freedom come? Does it come upon realizing who we are, what we can do? At, how, does, how does the question of sequence come about? The third question concerns the idea of neutrality towards conceptions of the good. It seems to me that the strongest counter argument that believers in the project of liberalism in the 20th century would offer to you 
would be to say that you might be right that different conceptions are the different conceptions of the right are not independent of conceptions of the good, but it matters enormously at what level of generality is formulated. And that they would claim, they formulate them at such levels of generality that are sufficiently high um, to allow precisely for what they that, that the conceptions of the right are formulated at a level of generality or the conceptions of the good? Well, conceptions of the, of the right are formulated at such a level of generality that they can encounter a sufficient number of conceptions of the good, which is what makes them legitimate. And finally, and this is a question of sense, you have mentioned Holmes and Deni and Cornelius. Yet each of us. I didn't call them prophets. Of, of jurists. Yes. Of jurists who care, of lawyers who care about the future. Well, yes. Uh, so uh, simply but, but a definition. A so what's a jurist? A jurist is a lawyer is a lawyer who cares about the future. But there's another element of prophecy. Well, I conceded that. Uh, in thinking of jurists in this way, I had already built into my definition a bias toward the prophetic impulse. I was making, a, at that point, an argument against myself, yes. as I might have been accused by circularity, of circularity. Which is inessential to my argument. Yes. My argument, my, my question goes to the fact that each of us would have many, a, a number of other possible names of, of, of people who, in a particular field of law in a particular field of thought to sort of play that, that role. Um, but I, just, I'm sorry, but I didn't mention Holmes and Genie and Yering and so forth as prophets. I mentioned them as exponents of this fighting theory of law. So it was not my intention to present them as exemplars of the prophetic spirit. In fact, they were for the most part very disillusioned uh, and uh, skeptical about the the claims of large normative projects. We can have the conversation yeah. about them. Uh, yeah. it, it is unclear to me why a prophet cannot be disillusioned. A prof yes. So a prophet not only can be disillusioned, but disillusionment is a characteristic moment in the formation of a prophet. The difference is this that in the formation of a prophet, there is the moment of being disillusioned with disillusionment, without which the prophetic impulse fails to arise. So the, the, this is, it's, it's, it's a, it shouldn't be so arcane. This is a very important point, which has some experiential immediacy. So everyone who teaches law or theory in these schools can have the following ex experience that he describes a dominant form of thought. And the students sit there as if it weren't about them, because their basic attitude is they never believed in that anyway. So it's, it's an attitude of ironic distance and defense, which is incompatible with transformation. Because the way in which the prophetic impulse comes to be experienced is a person has faith, then loses faith, and then tries to reacquire faith in a different form. And it's that dialectic that then leads to the ascent of the spirit. Whereas the posture of ironic distance and defense is a kind of spiritual death. But there comes a moment at which a, at which a disillusioned prophet to be blames the world I rest my last point, but I, I, I retain the first three questions that I have put. The first one concerns the difference between social forces and social structures. The second one, the idea of the, 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 the sequential nature at which the, the possibility of transcendence and freedom arises. And the third one... The sequential nature in relation to... In, in relation to the role. To the role. To the, to the social role. Yes. And the third one, the level of the generality. Yeah. So, uh, so, so first, on, on the question of the, of the levels of generality, I wasn't speaking about just a conception of right. My, my under, what, when I say that 
an order of right cannot be neutral among visions of humanity. I don't mean the, the conception of right as an ideological abstraction in some book. I mean the claim that a particular way of organizing society and especially organizing politics is the embodiment of this impersonal right. So long as it's just in the book, it sort of doesn't matter. It can be, it can be manipulated for all sorts of reasons. It's the claim that, for example, the liberal democracies of the North Atlantic world represent the neck plus ultra of the neutral force. That's the claim that matters. And that's the claim that has to be disputed. And a, an essential element in the dispute is the argument for an alternative. Because very early on in these arguments, someone will say, well, so what's the alternative? Uh, and, and there is the very concrete point at which the work of legal theory, reoriented in the fashion which I have defended, becomes pertinent. Because if we imagine the ideological struggle as a contest among abstractions, they can't produce transformation. It's, 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 when it's brought down to the level of the institutional details that we then begin to have hope because we see that around the existent, there is a penumbra of adjacent possibles, and that the existing variations and contradictions of the law can be mobilized in the service of these alternatives. That's the kind of argument that I'm making. Uh, then on the question of the roles, my understanding is this, that that there is never a ready-made role for any serious task in the world. So uh, there's a task, an interest, a vision, and you look around and you ask yourself, where, in, on what basis, on the basis of what role will I pursue that task? And there is never a self-evident answer to that question. Because, I argue, the roles that exist in the world are roles for the reproduction of what exists. And so it's the, the sequence is that if you have begun with the idea that there's a natural marriage between a an understanding of interests or ideals and the existing arrangements and the existing roles, you begin to hit up against the limits of those arrangements and those roles. You then come to redefine the ideals or the interests, but then you turn around and say, but where's the role in which I'm to do this? And it doesn't exist. So, the first step then is to seize on one of the existing roles and use it incongruously. Uh, now, uh, to then at the next stage transform the roles. So let me, let me contrast this to a view with which it has a superficial similarity. For example, Sartre's view about roles. All roles are bad. And so to be a human being, you can only perform a role in bad faith. But that's an aspect of the more general view, the romantic view, carried forward in existentialism uh, and prefigured in the mystical tendencies within the world religion that all structures of the hand of might is killing the spirit. So we can't escape the structures. All we can do is shake them periodically. And the moments in which we shake them are the moments in which we're more fully human. The crowd in the streets against the bureaucratic apparatus. Romantic love against the routines of marriage, and so forth. Uh, it's a kind of despair. And what it despairs of is our power to change the relation between self and structure which is a premise of my argument. We can do more than shake the structure. 
or periodically replace one kind of structure, one structure by another of the same kind. We can change the, the nature of a structure so that it's less of an alien thing. Uh, and that's the hope that is then uh, implicit in these arguments. Now, finally, we come back to your question about forces and regimes. So I take it that the, 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 the comparative advantage of law and legal thought on my model of the crucifixion, the ideals and interests nailed to the cross of the institutions and practices, is that law is about the organization of things in detail. And the organization of things then shapes everything. Uh, so to, to, to mobilize the, the resources of law, then one wants to be able to deal with this structural stuff, not at the level of abstraction, but at the level of detail. And the task is, how can it be both detailed and structural? That's what distinguishes a superior form of legal thought. Uh, now then come the question of the interests or forces as we describe them. So there is this duality always in the understanding of an interest. For example, the interests of the organized labor force headquartered in the capital intensive sectors of industry, which is the historical constituency of the left parties in, the, in, in Europe, the core historical constituency. There's always one way of understanding an interest that is institutionally conservative and socially exclusive. So you say, mass production is in crisis, is declining, is being threatened by plant closing or by the reallocation of productive facilities to foreign countries. The task of the progressives is to defend on the rear guard their niche, the niche of this this, this shrinking sector of the labor force, the organized workers in capital intensive mass production. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a sinking ship, it has no future. And it, it, that institutionally conservative view is then associated with the socially exclusive notion that the groups closest in social space to the defending group are the enemy. So the foreign workers, the temporary workers, the subcontracted workers. But there's always another way of understanding and defending the group interest, which is institutionally transformative and socially solidaristic. So it would say, there's no future in the rear guard defense of mass production. The future lies in using the power <coughs> of the state to increase the access to the advanced forms of production. And then all of the groups that we used to think of as our enemies can potentially become our allies. The small business class, the temporary workers, the subcontracted workers, and so forth. Uh, that move toward a different way of defining and defending the group interest requires, as one of its elements, that you have institutional ideas that you believe that there might be an alternative. And that alternative cannot be inferred from abstractions like socialism. It has to be constructed from below through the extension of these variants that are already contained in the law, but that are suppressed by the idealizing and systematizing ambitions of the method of reasoned elaboration. Yes? Like that 
third uh, institutional initiative that you uh, see as moving many in the direction. Correct. So, uh, your question raises the raises the problem of the institutional details, and the focus of my intervention was not to discuss in detail particular transformations. Uh, I mentioned them in passing only in relation to my general theme. So premise, one of the premises of my argument is that the world now lives under a dictatorship of no alternative. It's a very restricted repertory of live institutional options for the organization of different parts of social life. And our greatest interest is to uh, rebel against this false destiny by enlarging the repertory. That is a large part of the work of legal thought understood in the spirit in which I have defended. Uh, once you start to think in that spirit, there, there are a, a, an open-ended list of projects that become of great moment. So, let me take your example of the democratized market economy and give you just two, two instances of what I take to be legal projects of great transformative significance going in such a direction. So uh, we think that after the, for this mass production, there begins to emerge in all the major economies in the world uh, a different style of production, sometimes called post-forges, or the new economy, and uh, characterized by a, a more radical experimentalism, by permanent innovation, by attenuation of the contrast between conception and execution. What happens is that this advanced form of production is largely quarantined in vanguards, in vanguard sectors, from which most of the labor force is excluded. Because although the practices of advanced production are not inherently restricted to any particular sector in the economy, it depends on very special presuppositions, such as a high level of cognitive capability or a dense network of association, social capital. And these conditions are missing from most of the economy. So then the question is, how can we act and enlist the powers of the state so as to disseminate these advanced practices through large parts of the economy. Then we begin a trajectory of, uh, of problems and tasks that lead into each other. So we might say, well, we can't do this under the aegis of the two models of government business relations that now exist in the world. There's the American model of arm's length regulation of business by governments. And the, there is the Northeast Asian model of formulation of unitary trade and industrial policy imposed top down. We need a form of strategic coordination between governments and firms that is decentralized, pluralistic, and participatory to the end of disseminating these post fortis practices widely in the economy. That's an innovation in the content of the market economy. It's not just regulation in the market. And it then would lead at a second stage to more radical experiments in the coexistence of alternative regimes of contract and profit. Now, let me give you a second instance. Uh, <clears throat> so the, for this mass production, which I just mentioned, is the historical basis <laughs> of collective bargaining. <coughs> of the way of representing the interests of labor. Labor is assembled in large productive units under the aegis of large corporate entities, and they then bargain in the forms established by labor law. Uh, this, uh, uh, way of organizing <coughs> labor, which we think of as natural, is actually a historical anomaly, which seems to have prevailed only in the period from the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th. It was preceded by several centuries in which labor was organized on a decentralized basis in the form of <coughs> networks of contractual arrangements, what Karl Marx called the footing out system. 
And now we find that this same decentralized contractual organization of labor is coming back in a new form on a worldwide basis. But there is no legal regime designed to protect, organize, and represent labor on these conditions, precarious labor. So a completely different legal regime would have to be created alongside the traditional regime of collective bargaining. And that, too, would count as an instance of democratizing the market economy. Now, my, my, the, the main point that I want to illustrate through these two examples is this. No one could infer the, the, the content of those tasks from abstractions like social democracy or socialism. They have to do with the details with the details of the adjacent possible that exist only as law. But where is legal thought? It's occupied with this spellbinding, with this business of reasoned elaboration, the little thing of adjudication, and then this idea that it's a system. And so the, the, the immense power and responsibility of legal thought is diminished and squandered by being lavished on unworthy objects, and the prophetic mission of legal thought is suppressed. So my whole intervention is a rebellion against that. And uh, to, 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 to bring the idea to life, we would have to have many hours in which I could go through this multitude of details, like this one. And, and then we would see that uh, how much substance how much potential substance there is in, in such an intellectual project. Professor, maybe we can pause on you and invite you and everyone else to move to the next room. Very good. Close the refreshments, but, but, but to continue the conversation. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.